the name. Hey! Even about the name of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus in the morning. Jesus in the noonday. Jesus in the nighttime. Giving you honor, giving you glory, and giving you praise this morning. Thanking you, God, for being our God and allowing us to be your people. We ask now, God, that you forgive us of all our sins. Sanctify us. Help us, oh God. Help us in this hour, oh God. Give us a clean heart, oh God. So that we can serve you, God. We pray now, God, that you void us of ourselves. That there be none of us in all of you. That you would be glorified. That your people will be edified. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our eyes, and open our ears to receive only from you, O oh God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, O oh God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength, my Redeemer. God, speak a word that will lift burdens today. Speak a word that will loose shackles today. Speak a word that will save the lost today. Speak a word that will mend broken hearts today, God. Speak to your people, God. Only as you can. And we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise for using us in this hour. We lift up this prayer in the name of Jesus, and together we seal it with amen, amen, and amen. Help me, Jesus, I need you. Our scripture this morning. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. And it reads this way from the New Living Translation. One day, 
as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once, and they followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called to them, and they came too. And verse number 22 says, they immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. You may have your seats. And you already know that I will not be before you very long. So I need you to go with me. I need you to stay with me because we're going to move quickly. If I had to choose a topic today, it would be called to be an introducer. Again, our topic today called to be an introducer. And I'm going to give you some reference scriptures because I'm going to give you an overview. But if you want details, you need to go and read these scriptures. So if you'd like to write them down, um, John chapter 1, John chapter 12, and Mark chapter 1. I'm going to give you a backdrop, but if you need details, when you go home, you got to do a little reading and a little research. Is that all right? Is that all right? All right. We are looking at chapter 4 uh, in the book of Matthew. And as Matthew opens up this chapter, he opens it with Jesus being led into the wilderness for 40 days and for 40 nights. If you start at verse number 1, it's how Matthew opens up this chapter. And where Jesus was led into the wilderness those 40 days and 40 nights, he was tempted by Satan. And after victory over Satan in the wilderness, Matthew picks up on Jesus' Galilean ministry. Jesus had ministered in Judea for about a year. And then he hears that John has been arrested. And so then Jesus takes his ministry right into the center of King Herod's kingdom, the same king who has just imprisoned John. And so he goes first to Nazareth, and then he goes on to Capernaum, fully engaged in his ministry on this earth as the Christ. Now, when you go back and you read, you realize that John the Baptist was a forerunner and John acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus has been baptized. The Holy Spirit has descended upon Jesus. And after that, he goes into the wilderness and he's tempted for 40 days and he begins his ministry. And this is a part Matthew picks up when he is in full swing of his ministry in Galilee. Okay? So now Matthew begins to introduce Jesus' disciples. And Capernaum was a fishing town on the Sea of Galilee. So it's not surprising that Jesus called several fishermen to follow him there in Capernaum. Matthew records the life-changing moment. Speaking of Jesus, um, he writes, while walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw these two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting their net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets, and they followed him. 
Now, this was not the first time that Jesus had met Peter and Andrew. In John chapter 1, we're taught that Andrew had been a former disciple of John the Baptist. And he was standing with John the Baptist one day when John saw Jesus, and he called out, Behold the Lamb of God. Andrew understood Jesus to be the Messiah in that moment. And then he went to get his brother Simon to meet Jesus also. So Jesus took one look at Simon and he immediately changed his name to Cephas, which is translated Peter. They had a previous encounter with Jesus. Then Jesus goes on a little further and he offers the same honor to James and to John, who were mending their nets in the boat with their father, Zebedee. James and John had grown up in Bethsaida, and they had heard the preaching of John the Baptist, and they joined the crowds that flocked to hear him and received his baptism of repentance. And they were pointed to the Lamb of God, and they received him as Christ. Then for a short time, they were his companions in his journeyings. And when Jesus began the first circuit of his Galilean ministry, he was all by himself. He left them to go back to their fishing business. And they could not tell at that time whether he would even care to use them again. So it was under these circumstances that now Jesus issues a new call to James and to John. And the Bible records that when Jesus called to them, they immediately followed him, leaving not only their boat behind, but they also left their father behind. They had a previous encounter with Jesus. I declare to you, if you've ever had a real encounter with Jesus, you'll never, never be the same. Never be the same again. They say, how did they just pick up and leave and go with Jesus like that? It's because they had encountered him previously. The offer was simple, yet life-changingly profound. Jesus simply said, come and follow me. Now they could hang out with the fish and do the same thing over and over day after day, or they could get past the nets and hear some amazing truths that would captivate their minds and that would confound the Bible bureaucrats and they could watch the lame walk again or they could watch the religious hypocrites burn with envy or they could watch the dead come to life. It was their choice. Jesus calls these poor, ordinary, unlearned men and he calls them to show that diligence in an honest calling pleases God. If you notice, they were working when God called them. When Jesus called them, they were working. Both sets of brothers were working. Idle, not. They were not idle. They were working when Jesus called them. And then Jesus chose these ordinary men to, to show that he chooses the foolish things of the world to confound those who see themselves to be wise. Jesus chose these men because the freedom of his grace, he can choose weak instruments. Because of the freedom of his grace, he can choose weak instruments. And he chose them because of his power that such men he called these poor, ordinary, unlearned men would come and subdue the entire world. This morning, I just want to take a screenshot of the brothers, Andrew and Peter. And I very briefly want to encourage those who have been called to the ministry of evangelism. Now, all of us are called to evangelize. But there are those who have been specifically called to the ministry of evangelism. So let's look at Peter, the impetuous one. 
We know much about Peter because throughout the Gospels, Peter continually bounces between spiritual highs and spiritual lows. Peter continually demonstrated how God loves to use ordinary people to achieve heavenly goals. In Matthew chapter 14, Peter walks on water and then he sinks. In Matthew chapter 16, Peter identifies Jesus as the Messiah. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus takes Peter to the mountaintop where he reveals his heavenly glory. And Peter then inappropriately offers to build memorials. In Matthew chapter 26, Peter denies Jesus three times. And on the day of Pentecost, pre Peter preached and 3,000 came to Christ. Peter the impetuous one. God can use anybody. Okay, then there's Andrew, Peter's brother, the introducer. Andrew is the one who brought Peter to Christ. Andrew was sort of a nondescript kind of person, seldom mentioned except in the list with the other disciples. Interestingly, every time Andrew is mentioned by himself, he is introducing others to Jesus. In John chapter 1, we read that he brought his brother to Jesus. In John chapter 12, he brought Jesus to some Greeks who wanted to meet him. Just think about what came out of those introductions. One of the greatest leaders of the New Testament, Simon Peter. And one of the greatest statements that Jesus ever made. When he saw the Greeks coming, Jesus said, and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Andrew was the one who pointed out the little boy with the lunch of two fish and five loaves of bread that Jesus used to feed more than 5,000. Each of us ought to aspire to be an introducer like Andrew. It is a tremendous, it is tremendous to realize that we are not salesmen nor saleswomen, but we are co-workers with God. He is the evangelist and we are the introducers. You and I cannot convert anyone. I must say that again. You and I cannot convert anyone, but God can use us to help lead people to him. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws me to them or draws them to me. One of the greatest needs today is for introducers. People who know how to put other people in touch with Jesus Christ. Many of us teach Sunday school we take part in Bible study groups. We live the best life we can, and all of that's important. But Jesus is a living person. He is not a formula. He is not an activity, nor is he an organization. Sharing our faith ultimately means introducing persons to the person. Jesus calls us to faithfulness. He calls us to be faithful to the task that he has given us, and that is the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, he says, Go ye, therefore, into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. So the key word here then is faith. God is going to do his work his way in his time and he will use our witness however he sees fit. I'm gonna say that again. God is going to do his work. See, we wanna, we wanna, we wanna plant, we wanna water, and we wanna take credit for all the increase, but it doesn't work like that. God is going to do his work his way in his time, and he will use our witness however he sees fit. 
So if we really believe this, then we won't manipulate people or play on their emotions. We won't try to persuade people in any way that restricts their freedom. We won't seduce people for Christ by getting them to make the right decision for the wrong reason. We will urge people lovingly, but we won't push people who are not, I'm talking to those called to the ministry of evangelism, okay? We, 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 we will urge people lovingly, but we won't push people who are not ready. We will watch for God's movement, and we will introduce everybody we can, but we will force no one. That's all right, y'all all right? Y'all quiet. You won't be shouting off this message, but maybe it'll make you think. Fishing is like soul winning. It is an art. It requires patience. Often there are lonely hours of waiting. It requires skill in the use of bait and lures and nets. It requires discernment and common sense in going where the fish are running. It requires persistence. A good fisherman is not easily discouraged. It requires quietness. The best policy is to avoid disturbances and keep self in the background. We become fishers of men only by following Christ. The more like him we are, the more successful we will be in winning others to him. Our responsibility is to follow Christ. He'll take care of all of the rest. When Jesus speaks, it's already done. I'm wrapping up right now. So I want to close with just these three reminders. I want to remind you of the call. Jesus is the one who calls. He calls those who are willing. He initiates the call. He empowers the call. And he sustains the call. If Jesus has called you to ministry, don't spend your time trying to prove to people that Jesus called you to ministry. Just do the work of the ministry the way Jesus, the way God has called you to do it. Because if he called you to ministry, he will empower you to minister, and then he will sustain your ministry. He will keep you while you're doing your ministry, and you don't have to convince anybody that Jesus called you or that God called you. Because he, 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 he not only calls, he empowers, and he sustains. He calls us to learn from him. He calls us to imitate him, and he calls us to submit to his plan for our lives. In John chapter 15 and verse 16, Jesus says this, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Not only did I choose you, but I appointed you to go and to produce fruit. Not only did I appoint you to go and produce food, fruit, but also I equipped you so that your fruit would remain. So who called you? So who assigned you? And where is your fruit? Because Jesus says the ministry I call you to ought to bear fruit. And then that fruit ought to remain. There ought to be some evidence. The call. And then the catch. Being an introducer requires a combination of humble patience and obedient expectancy. There is no more humbling experience than being on hand when God brings someone to himself. To see God creatively break into a life refreshes our spirit. It's like watching the birth of a child. We need to watch how God leads someone to himself so that we will be able to help him, to work with him. 
And then there's the commitment. Jesus calls us fully. Our obedience to the call should be prompt. It should be sacrificial. And it should be complete. He wants our devotion. He wants our resources. He wants our commitment. He wants our hearts. He wants our soul. He wants our mind. He, wa he wants everything. He wants our strength. So what are you willing to leave behind to follow Jesus? Are you willing to leave behind your aspirations? Are you willing to leave behind your money? Are you willing to leave behind your friends? Are you willing to leave behind all your stuff? What obstacles are you willing to leave behind? What material attachments are you willing to leave behind? What comfort zones are you willing to get out of in order to follow Jesus? Christ's offer to you today is the same as it was to those first disciples. He simply says, come and follow me. You can stay stuck in your old routine and you can keep hoping that someday you'll win the lottery or you can unstick yourself and you can let Jesus make something of your life. You can follow Jesus and surprisingly find that there is something more or nothing more but that, that there is something more exhilarating than just living your life your way. Have you ever been dragging around heavy burdens that somebody else put on you? You know, expectations that somebody else put on you because they thought you should have been this or that or doing this or that. Have you ever been just dragging that load around? Everywhere you go dragging around. How can I fix it, Lord? What can I do about it? Well, 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 God says this. He says, I, uh, I, I didn't put that on you. He says, I didn't put that on you. Okay? He says, I didn't give it to you. He said, and I don't really need to help you carry it because all you need to do is let it go. All you need to do is release it. Let it go. Drop it put it down, leave it behind, and follow me. And so why should we follow him? He says, because I am the burden lifter. He says, I am the one who lifts up your head. He says, I am your peace in the middle of the storm. He says, I am your heavy burden lifter. He says, I am your strength then when you get weak. And he says, I'm your heart fixer and your mind regulator. He says, I'm your company keeper in the lonely hours. He says, I'm your water in dry places. He says, I'm your high priest who knows everything that you feel. He says, as a matter of fact, I am that that I am. He says, I'm everything that you need I am it when you need it I am it the way you need it and I am it any time you need it he says I'm whatever 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 you need I am that that I am whatever it is you need me to be I am that He's been that for me. He'll be that for you. Whatever, whatever you want him to be, he is that for you. I don't know about you, but I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. Don't no one join me, yet I will follow. No turning back. I've come too far, not going back. I've come this far, leaning on the Lord. No turning back, no turning back. No 
turning back. No turning back. No turning back. We bless the Lord for the message and for the messenger. For truly he's a on time God. Yes, he is. We have to be reminded that he may not come when we want him, but he'll be there right on time, for he's an all time God. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. The message today was on time. The messenger today was on time. So is our response today going to be on time? For the Lord is extending himself to us yet again. What an awesome God. Yet again, he stands here and as she said, I am that I am. And in this moment, we want to offer Christ unto you. Now we're going to extend an invitation first to those who have never accepted him as their Lord and Savior. Now, as we said, as it was in the scripture, many had had an encounter with Jesus along the way. Think about it. That sickness that you did not succumb to, Jesus. That heartache that didn't utterly take you out, Jesus. That job that you got that you were not qualified for, Jesus. When you thought you were going to lose your mind, Jesus. That habit that you couldn't break but you're still here today, Jesus. You have had an encounter with Jesus. And he stands here today saying, I am that I am. And I want to be so much more. Come on to Jesus just as you are. He has so much more for you. And as she said, just leave your burdens there. Just leave them to him and God will take care of you. Perhaps you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior and things got a little rough, got a little tough, and you kind of put him to the back burner, but God is married to the backslider. And he stands here welcoming you with open arms. He says, come on back. I knew it. That's why I sent my son Jesus to die a horrific death so that you would have a way to come on back. Come on back to Jesus just as you are. And perhaps you're in right standing with the Lord, but you don't have a local place to fellowship with where you can grow and serve and use the gifts and talents God has given you. We offer you to become a member here at the Great Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church. For we were always saved to serve. But he's an all time God, right? Yes, he is. Where is there one today, whether they're here or in the airways, who can acknowledge that you've had an encounter with God and you want more and more and more of him? You're tired of carrying around the burdens of this world and thinking you need to have an answer to every question. Jesus is your answer. Come to him while you yet have time. 